here comes our Atlantis crew. On behalf of the greatest team in the world, uh, good luck to you and your crew on the final fly of the true American icon. Go for main engine start. All three engines up and burning. Two, one, two. And lift off, the final lift off of Atlantis. Shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue. Hello, and thank you for joining us today to discuss and celebrate the 10th anniversary of the 135th and final space shuttle missions. So on July 8th, 2011 at 1129 in the morning, Space Shuttle Atlantis launched from Kennedy Space Center and then docked with the International Space Station's Harmony module almost 48 hours later. The primary cargo was a multi-purpose logistics module, Raffaello, and a lightweight multi-purpose carrier. Before I get to the panel, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context about this final flight. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the dedication of the whole workforce. Teams had been working out at the orbiter processing facility, at the VAB and at the launch pad, and really across the agency, just to process Atlantis for this very last time. I can really vividly recall the intensity about the last flight of this iconic mission. But the overwhelming sense from the entire workforce was pride, extra pride. They, they went above and beyond because they wanted to do the very best and make sure that the crew was brought home safely. They were going above 100% for that. And all of this, despite this, uh, knowing that many of them already had pink slips in hand. They knew that their job would be going away once his final flight was completed. And we made lots of room at the Kennedy Space Center to accommodate guests to view this last historic launch. Um, we put so many people all across the center. There was people on the bridges, people lined the beaches. Everybody wanted to be witness to this last piece of history of the shuttle program. And I think Commander Ferguson's last words before launch included a big thanks to the KSC workforce. Hey, thanks to you and your team, Mike. Until the very end, you all made it look easy. The shuttle is always going to be a reflection of what a great nation can do when it dares to be bold and commits to follow through. We're not ending the journey today, Mike. We're completing a chapter of a journey that will never end. You and the thousands of men and women who gave their hearts, souls, and their lives for the cause of exploration have rewritten history. Let's light this fire one more time, Mike, and witness this great nation at its best. The crew of Atlantis is ready for launch. Doing that big loop for the last time, and Ron welcoming you all to the space station, saying for the last time, and then Sandy showing the world the return of the socks, and having that phone call with President Obama, and leaving the American flag on the flight deck until the next astronaut launch from American soil to retrieve it. And then there was a landing, and I was there on the shuttle landing facility looking up and hearing the, those iconic twin sonic booms, the pre-flare maneuver, the rotating and then the final touchdown. It was a really, really emotional moment for everyone, the convoy crew, the families, the workforce, knowing that this was gonna be the very last time. And we all walked out and checked out the underside of the Lannis and, to, and check out how close to the center line the, the vehicle and the landing was. And again, at that last post-flight conference, Commander Ferguson spoke again about all the efforts of the entire workforce. And I have a picture, uh, a plaque that you, the crew gave to the Kennedy Space Center to thank them for all the work that they had done. So joining me to reflect on this historic mission is a crew. First, we have Chris Ferguson, Doug Hurley, Rex Waldheim, and then Sandy Magnus. The journey didn't end. You guys completed a chapter to the journey that continues today. So let me get to some questions here. So Doug, let me start with you. You have the distinction of flying on the final shuttle mission and then launching in the first crewed flight from American soil in almost a decade when you flew SpaceX's Demo-2 certification mission. How has space travel changed since the close of the shuttle days and how did the flights feel to you and what are you excited about in this next new chapter? Well, it's just, uh, it's a real honor to be here and uh, share this uh, 
this video with uh, my crewmates. It's been far too long since the four of us have gotten together. Um, you know, it was a it was a huge change, I think, in a lot of ways, because the the way the shuttle was by the time we flew, almost every minute of your day was perfectly scripted. We knew what the training was going to be like. And then, of course, the mission was completely scripted, almost down to the microsecond, it seemed. Uh, but for the Crew Dragon uh, flight, you know, we, along with the folks at Boeing, you know, had to develop training. We had to develop the vehicle. We had to figure out what the displays were going to look like. We had to figure out how we were going to operate Dragon. And so it was a it was a completely different feel going into the mission. And we got to the point where we were comfortable with the procedures. We got to the point where we were comfortable with the uh, the vehicle itself. And, th and then we took it flying for that for that test flight. So uh, a little bit different. I think we're starting to get into a rhythm now with the uh, commercial flights. And uh, hopefully uh, Boeing will launch their their uncrewed test flight here very soon, hopefully in the next uh, few months. And then we'll see that pace even continue. Um, things are changing rapidly. Uh, not only with the commercial sector, but uh, of course, Artemis, uh, potentially Artemis one launching uh, later this year. So it's an exciting time. It really is. It's amazing how far we've come in this last 10 years. Yeah, thank you, uh, Doug. It is a it is quite an exciting time. So let me see, Chris, when when asked where you thought you would be in 10 years, you responded that people would be traversing back and forth to low Earth orbit. People would be spending time in orbit. We'd be utilizing commercial space flight. We would have launched or would be close to launching a heavy lift vehicle. All those predictions were true, but what is something that has surprised you about how the space program has evolved over the past decade? You know, I, I would have to say, you know, I look at the way uh, the comings and goings at the International Space Station now uh, are just amazing. I, you know, look at I look at the month of July coming up and all the ambitious things uh, that uh, that NASA and the international partners are doing. Uh, there's a, a Russian large module that's uh, that's anticipated will, will launch. There's a SpaceX cargo flight that's coming and going. There is a a, a Boeing flight that will be going. There's a a, a Northrop Grumman uh, flight that is scheduled to go. I mean, all this in the span of one month. Uh, Sandy, how about you? Where did you where do you see the space program ten years from now? You know, it's it's really an exciting question because to the points that that Doug and Fergie already made, there's so much going on now. You know, we're we're getting to the point now after 10 years of development, the, the commercial crew programs are taking off. Um, Artemis is getting ready to take off, and so we're going to continue this transition. I think of seeing more and more non-governmental driven activity. The government will be clearly a, a major factor, but you look at the Axiom One flight, which is a private commercial flight to the space station and then another SpaceX flight that's going not to the space station. They're going to go do their own thing in orbit for a few days and come back. You'll see more and more. The suborbital community is getting ready to take off here soon with, with launching people. So we're going to get, we're seeing a lot more engagement in space with a wider variety of people. And that's going to have an effect, I think, on, on our society and how people think about the relationship to the earth as the, the breadth of people that have access expands. So Rex, uh, STS-134 was originally slated to be the last shuttle flight with STS-135 on deck as just a contingency mission in the event that 134 needed a rescue. How did it feel to get called for one more mission? And can you talk a little bit about what it felt like to prepare for a mission where the rescue plan potentially meant an extended stay on the International Space Station? Yeah, it was it was really exciting because uh, when they said that STS-134 was the final flight, you know, I had volunteered to be on any of the last three flights, but when they named the last three crews, I thought, well, dang, I didn't make it. It was kind of like you know, being in line for Space Mountain and the line closes right before you get up there. <laughs> and they started talking about STS-135. And yeah, originally we were just a rescue mission for 134, but, you know, we had all the parts. We had an external tank, a shuttle, and two solid rocket boosters. And it's kind of like the 4th of July. When you have one firework left in the box, you don't leave it there. You fire them all off. We're Americans. And so I was pretty sure that we were going to fire off, too. So I, 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 we had pretty good confidence that we'd actually fly. And so, so that was really neat to, to make it official when they finally did tell us. And it was a interesting uh, proposal for how we would get down. We each had a, a window of if we got stuck up there where there's no rescue craft to come get us. Uh, various times we'd have to stay up there. So I think uh, I, I was going to be one of the first ones down and, and Doug was going to be the, had the, 
the, the, the task of he would have to stay up for a whole year if we got stuck up there. And up then, none of us the Americans never spent a year in space before. So he had the, he had the tough duty if we got stuck up there. But uh, fortunately, everything worked out okay, and we didn't have to. Came home on the shuttle. Uh, well, thank you for that. So, Chris, have you been to see Atlantis at the KSC Visitor Complex? And how did you feel seeing it again after all these years? Uh, I'll tell you, it's uh, it's great. It, you know, I, I I still claim it's the four of ours orbiter, and we just let you guys keep it in your garage. Um, but uh, but it it is. Uh, I've been through there several times with a few groups, and uh, you know that that when that pre-show ends and the curtain goes up, it still it still gives me goosebumps. Um, it's you know it's great to walk around it and see it. It's just a fantastic exhibit. Uh, I mean, you can get right up close and personal, and uh, I really think it has been just a hit there at the KSC. Uh, and now SpaceX is flying, you know, astronauts Boeing soon will be. Um, you know, I, I think that the interest in the future of space has likely never been greater than it is now, you know, especially as we're, we're on the threshold of Artemis. You know, the first stage of Artemis just rolled into, into the big VAB a couple of weeks ago. I mean, there's just, there's more going on at KSC that I could have possibly imagined 10 years ago. And it's, but it's just great to see Atlantis there too. It's, it's just a great piece of history. Yeah, hey, thanks for that. Um, let me go to uh, Sandy. Can you tell, me, tell us about your best memory of the STS-135 mission? Uh, maybe your socks, or we heard a story about Peach Jam. Can you, uh, can you uh, clue us in on that? I don't know this story about Peach Jam. I don't know who came up with that. You know, the Sox thing was a flashback to Expedition 18, but I think what I enjoyed the most about this mission was the crew. I mean, working with these guys was absolutely fantastic. And we laughed so much. We trained so hard. It was a very short training session. We were all very focused, but we had such a wonderful time with each other doing it and I'm just listening to these guys bandy jokes. I was the appreciative audience most of the time. And then on orbit, I have never been so busy in my whole entire life. <laughs> you know, and, and they extended us a day and they gave us more work to do. And we were like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. But <laughs> we had fun the whole time. We because it was just a fun crew. And I really I look I mean that's one of my favorite memories just working with these guys. Ah, uh, thanks. And uh, Doug, how about you? What was your uh, favorite memory or about that peach jam. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the peach jam too. I think, you know, for me, I I, I agree with Sandy, you know, it, it's hard to pick just one one event or one favorite because you, you know, things happen pretty quick. I think it was like 9 months from the time, you know, we kind of knew we were going to fly until we were back. And, and so from a shuttle standpoint, that was pretty quick. But uh you know, it's it's down to maybe two pretty noteworthy discussions. The first was when the uh, the we had the launch hold, and I remember you yep. know there was some there was some distinct conversations going on in the crew module, and and I had scrubbed uh, almost a half a dozen times on my first flight, but never at the point where the APUs were started and we were getting ready to go. So I just looked over at Fergus and said, "The APUs are running," you know, and then. <laughs> I got the look back like, hey, we'll, we'll get it sorted out like he always did. You know, um, that was a pretty interesting memory. And then I think the other one, which is a little bit more solemn, was that last night we were on orbit. Um, we had undocked and we had talked to Megan, who's in space right now, by the way, Megan Bankin, Megan MacArthur Bankin. Um, she was our uh, Capcom. And, uh, you know, we were saying, uh, Chris was saying some great stuff to the to mission control. And then we were done for the night and we were going to come back the next morning and shut all the lights off on the flight deck. And we were just looking out the window and, you know, you think about it, every time you go to space, you just have to take it all in because you never know if you're going to go back. Uh, and it was just, just the four of us, it was kind of quiet, but yet you could just tell we were all sharing that moment together. And I, that to me, I will never, ever forget that. It was, it's still so vivid in my mind 10 years later. Uh, thanks, Doug. That sounds pretty special. Rex, how about you? What's your favorite memory? There's a lot of them, like if he, like everybody said so far, the ascent and uh, and coming back home. Uh, it was all pretty amazing, and uh, it was my first nighttime reentries. I'd never done nighttime, so that was spectacular. And uh, to see the uh, the plasma around the vehicle it, it, when you're doing night reentry, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, we had a we had a a, a, a agreement that I was going to be the last one to completely suit up because I got everybody uh, strapped in their seats and stuff, and I was going to I was going to finish strapping in after the Europe burn. 
So I get everybody strapped in and stuff, and then we get into the uh, into the plasma from re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, and it is glowing orange, and flames are flicking around the, the windows. And I think Fergie said, hey, Rex, you need to get your suit on. And I'm thinking, yeah, I know. You know, it was, it was pretty, pretty <laughs> So we keep coming back down. All of a sudden, we start turning into an airplane, and it gets some vibrations and stuff. And we usually do the entry with uh, with the one light on, so I can see my knee board, so I can make all the calls to keep these guys on their on their uh, on their actions and stuff. And this time, Fergie and 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 Doug decided they wanted it dark enough, so they turned the light off, so I couldn't see anything. So I had to remember all my uh, calls by by heart. And it's a little bit disoriented for my seat because I can't see the runway, can't see anything going on. I'm thinking, man, this is really uncomfortable. But then we come up on the heading alignment circle where we fly a circle and line up with the runway. And Fergie's job is to hand it over to Doug for a second. Doug flies it and then he hands it back to Fergie and Fergie lands it. So when uh, when Fergie hands it over to Doug, I hear Doug go, this is so cool. And when he said, like, oh, we got it. No problem. We're landing just fine. So that was, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, Chris, how about you? What's your favorite memory? Um, there's a, there's more than just one, but l- let me just extend the story that that uh, that, that Rex was just saying about um, you know getting ready to land. Um, sometime in there, I'm sure you all remember this. Uh, I mean, we're literally a minute and a half from landing, and there's this very loud bang that comes from from the mid deck, and you know, we all were like, the last thing you want to hear, you know, a minute away from landing a space shuttle is a very loud bang. And, you know, fortunately, Rex, you know, being the perfectly clairvoyant guy, he usually was, looks down and says, oh, he says the, the, the WCS, the toilet door just swung open and hit the ladder. And that was the, the <laughs> loud bang. But, but uh, you know, these silly little things, you never really occur in space, uh, you know, really do. And, and uh, but it, it, the, the ending was all fine. Hey, I, re- I have uh, one memory that was, you know, sort of one of the, the funnier things. I, I remember uh, uh, Jerry Ross handing me uh, a, a Ziploc bag with American flag with very explicit directions on what to do with that flag. And we read the directions and Chunky knows about that flag. I hope it's sitting somewhere in a, in a drawer of his right now. But he, uh, he says, and he looks me in the eye, Jerry Ross, he says, and when you have your interview with President Obama, don't forget the flag. So I thought, got it, Jerry, I'm all over this. Uh, so, you know, days go by uh, and, um, you know, probably 10 days later, we're gathering for this interview and, and it's, uh, you know, President Obama and a few other distinguished individuals are on and, and we're on. And, and about, you know, 30 seconds into this, you know, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, my hands are behind my back and the flag is not in either one of them. How's this, how's this gonna go? And it ended up going fine. But uh, but that was just one of my, you know, one of my interesting memories uh, amongst many. If, if you remember, Fergie, we were all working furiously and you were calling us. We're meeting with the president. Get in here now. And we literally got there five seconds before that event started. <laughs> but you guys look good at it. I can tell you that. So what are you going to miss uh, the most, uh, Sandy, since you're uh, up? What, what, do you, what do you miss the most? About being in space? Yeah, about being in space. Being in space. <laughs> <laughs> when we left, when we left um, 135, I was, you know, Fergie was the last one out. It was just before him. And I was, I had a few tears in my eyes because I'm thinking, you know, this is probably the last time I'm going to be here. And uh, it, you know, I felt, it feels like my second home that I can never return to, right? It's just so magical to live up there and have that experience and, and, and live there long term. Doug, you had that opportunity now. It's way different than a shuttle mission. And it's just super special, and I, I do miss it. Rex, how about you? You know, I, I missed the whole the whole shuttle team. You know, you you mentioned that uh, Janet earlier that you know what a pleasure it was to work with that whole team. It's just, it was a it was a large team, and it just is a little bit different than what we have today. But it was a large team, and and we all worked together, and they were launching regularly. People, you know, seven people into space regularly. And the dedication was absolutely apparent when we were training. And I remember once we were at the KSC and this person came up to me and said, hey, I wanted you to know that I've been working on the shuttle program for 25 years and this is my last day. And I go, I'm so sorry. But they go, no, 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 don't be sorry. I am so happy I had the opportunity to do this. And that's how just about everybody felt. It was just so happy to be a part of that. And so I really missed that being part of that, that, that shuttle team and helping getting people ready to launch, launching yourselves, coming back and telling everybody about it. Uh, yeah, thanks. It, uh, the workforce was incredible. How about you, uh, 
uh, Chris, what's your, uh, what, 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 what will you miss the most? Uh, you know, it's, it's the team, the teamwork. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of camaraderie, I think that went with, uh, with shuttle crews. Um, you know, and, and, and when you sort of leave the business, uh, things get a little more, I'll say individual, in, individualistic. Um, but, uh, I also, you know, I, I miss, uh, I miss the operations team a lot. Uh, I think Doug had brought up earlier that, you know, we had a unique opportunity to turn the lights off and look out the window. And, you know, you would think, well, you guys are always so busy. How do you have the opportunity to do something like that? And the truth is, is we always had, you know, these outstanding teams on the ground looking over our shoulders and enabling us to do this. And I, I went back and looked at the names of some of the flight directors who led the mission. And amazingly, you know, a lot of them are still with the program. Uh, Richard Jones, uh, Quatsi Alabrujo, who has left, Rick uh, Lebrode. Tony Sicacci, Courtney McMillan, that we still work very closely with and commercial crew, Chris Edelin, same story. Uh, so a lot of these folks are still around, still leading teams. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this is a business that once it gets in your, in your blood, it's, it's hard to get it out. And it's great to still have these senior individuals around uh, making this all happen. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. And Doug, how about you? What were you miss the most? Well, from the shuttle program. Yeah, it, 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 it's kind of like I, I remember John Young saying this very early on. It's not, you know, what you fly, but it's who you fly with. And I think, you know, it, it kind of echoes what these guys have all said. You know, it's 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 building the team and then seeing it being completed successfully. And then, you know, it, it's it's a bonus when you really like who you're flying with. And, you know, you, you have that dynamic with a crew and. And that doesn't always happen. You know, it, it uh, you, you know, I, I think people think it's magically we put crews together and they just automatically work. And, you know, sometimes it's more of a challenge. And I think with this this group, you know, we just almost instantaneously connected. And and I think it showed. Yeah. Hey, thanks for that. I do. Uh, I do recall, like I said, that feeling people were so honored to be a part of that last mission and they wanted it to go flawlessly. And I think uh you guys uh, uh, made the whole mission look that way. And it looks like you guys had a lot of fun as well. So so one just uh, last question for all of you. Uh, any last thoughts or lessons learned that you would impart to uh, those of us uh, on the ground here, either the workforce uh, or around the, around the agency? Any lesson learned or the final thoughts? Doug, why don't you go ahead and start? I just think, you know, we have to continue what we're doing and kind of what the shuttle program has led us to, you know, 10 years later. You know, it was a, a huge effort. We had to stay with it. We built the space station. We serviced Hubble. We launched satellites. We did a whole bunch of incredible things. Uh, and and with the end of that program, now we've we've talked about this. You know, we've got a commercial, uh, a, a vibrant commercial program in low Earth orbit. Uh, that's only getting bigger, it seems like by the by the month. Uh, and then and then for us uh, at NASA it is to just continue this exploration phase that we're we're finally starting to do again beyond low Earth orbit, you know, going to the moon and 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 establishing a base hopefully there and then reaching out into the solar system to Mars. I think you know those are the things that you know the lessons learned from the shuttle program, the lessons learned now from commercial crew, you know, are going to lead us uh, out into the solar system. I'm very excited to be a part of it. Thank you, Doug. How about you, Sandy? Final uh, thoughts or uh, lessons to share? Yeah, I think I think it's important that as we move forward uh, and more and more activities taking place in space with more people flying, more vehicles flying, that we don't learn, don't lose the lessons of the past. Right? We all know space is hard. It's taken the commercial industry ten, for uh, lots of reasons, 10, 10 years to, to s just get on the brink of starting to launch people. Um, you know, at, at, at NASA, we took every shuttle mission very seriously, practically rebuilding the vehicle from, from the ground up and paid a lot of attention to that. Now, maybe that was too much and these commercial guys are gonna have to figure out where that balance is. But as they do that, they should not forget the lessons that we learned in the shuttle program because lessons in our industry are very painful and and i think we we have you know we're going to be learning more as a community as the community gets broader and broader but i i, I would just encourage people to keep their eye on the past to inform their future actions and and take the good lessons and the bad lessons and apply them appropriately and, and do new learning and that would be very healthy 
Yeah, br br brilliant, brilliant observation. Uh, Rex, how about you? Final thoughts and uh, and or lessons learned? Yeah, I think I'd tag on to what Sandy said in that it's it's amazing what an incredible group of people can accomplish when they when they put their minds to it from the the ground team, the processing team, the, the flight crews, the operators, and everybody working together. Um, we learned some lessons the hard way in the shuttle program. There's no doubt about it. But we learned from them and we moved on. And uh, we closed out the shuttle program very strongly. And it, 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 that came by paying attention and being diligent. And uh, I, I believe the last few shuttle flights were some of the flawless ones we've ever flown. From a, from a hardware standpoint, from an execution standpoint, they really went well. And that's because people on all the teams worked together to, to get it done. And then the last thing I would say is just – is to everybody who hasn't had a chance to fly is what a magical place it is going to space and it is worth the effort to get there the things we learn are amazing on this on the space station and just the adventure itself is absolutely incredible and i hope we do democratize space so that everybody gets a chance to go there at some point and it becomes routine because it is an absolutely an amazing place uh thank you rex that's uh, very, very inspiring and Chris, uh, I'll end with you. Uh, final thoughts and or lessons learned for the group. Yeah, space flight is uh, it's definitely hard, but I'd have to say of, um, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that young men and women can do these days. But if you had to look at, at what is probably, you know, uh, your ability to sit back and take pride in what you have done, there is nothing like watching a, you know, a rocket launch. I mean, this is where the collective intelligence of our country come together to do something that's absolutely amazing. Uh, go into space, do whatever it does, dock to the space station, support humans for months at a time, uh, and then come back and, and safely land on land or, or, or in the ocean. And then, you know, as a participant in that, sit back and look at it and say, I have been a part of something that's truly much larger than me. Uh, and uh, it, it's just, it's a great feeling to have been a part of it. And, and I, I try to sort of instill a little bit of that excitement in, in the young men and women who come into the field right now, because they will be the ones that, that go and live in, in lunar orbit or on the lunar surface or, you know, someday maybe even go to Mars. Uh, it, it's, it's a hard business, but I'll tell you, it is, it's just one of the most rewarding I can ever imagine. Oh, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Chris. Uh, and also, uh, thanks to everyone uh, on the panel here today. We really appreciate hearing from you and uh, reflecting on uh, the last and final uh, space shuttle mission. So it might have been the last shuttle mission, but the entire team of launch control personnel were carefully monitoring Atlantis to make sure that she was ready for that final trip. The NASA launch director in charge still carried all of the same responsibility for the safety of the crew like any other previous launch. And even if he didn't know it at the time, he was helping NASA's next launch director prepare for the future. Here are retired launch director Mike Leinbach and Artemis launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson. Thank you so much, Janet. We appreciate those kind words. Hello, I'm Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Artemis launch director with the Exploration Ground Systems Program here at Kennedy. Joining me today is retired shuttle launch director and my friend, Mike Leinbach. Mike, it's great to see you today. Charlie, it's always great to be with you and the, and the gang out here at KSC. It's like, like old times. And it's really neat to see the crew today and to be thinking about and reflecting on STS-135 and that final landing of Space Shuttle Atlantis. It was, um, it was a special mission. The old mission was outstanding and uh, you know, I, I, I was reflecting the other morning about 135 and how special those four folks were and still are to me and, and to the rest of the program and to NASA and to the, and to the country. Um, it was an outstanding time. It was the end of the end of the program, so a little bittersweet, but nevertheless, we, we did it like we planned and, and it was the safest flight in the shuttle program. Speaking of it being like that last flight, Mike, do you have like a memory or I know I have a couple, but well, I have more than a couple, but I certainly have two <laughs> yeah. that stand out. But do you have one as the launch director for that final mission? I mean, anything well, that. Well, you remember we talked long and long and hard leading up to the launch day about we wanted to make it the same for Fergie and his crew that we did for all the other missions leading up to the final launch and, and mission. And, and we owed that to them to do it the Absolutely. same, and, and uh, so we, we stressed that quite a bit, and, and we pulled that off. It was it was a, it was a glorious to watch the launch team perform. Um, 
I do, I do remember though after launch, I went around and shook everybody's hand on the floor of the firing room, and I'd never done that before. And there were a lot of uh, pats on the back and hugs, and you know, a couple, a oh, couple yeah. little weepy eyes. But uh, you know, it, it was a it was a great mission, and, and it sure was great seeing him back here. It was a great mission, and and like you, I have a similar memory. Is you know, after launch, leading up to 135, if you think about it. You know, you had teams that had been there through tanking, been there through T0, and you generally have, you know, folks that are like changing out the shift and, and we go downstairs and, and, and kind of break bread together. And I remember after 135, we were going to take those pictures, right, to kind of get that historical right, yes. um, capturing of the moment. And I remember that after the pictures were made uh, or taken, we all kind of stood there and it was it was almost like um, you wanted to just savor the moment for just a little longer. You, you wanted to make it last. You wanted to remember it, and that's one of those memories for me that that you know sticks with me to this day. Was just realizing that this team is together for this very historic launch, maybe for the final time, like this group of people. And it was it was really, as you said, it was very it was bittersweet. It was bittersweet, and and you think about some of the, some of the folks on the launch team. Uh, we've been on the launch team uh, dozens of years. I was on the launch team over 20 years myself. Uh, Mac McCaskey came from the Apollo program and still, still launching the shuttle. And um, it was um, to see the team pull together, stay together, and do the job right, knowing that the end was coming and that some of them would would be laid off and even in the face of that we all they all pulled together and did the right thing for the for the good of the crew and that's yeah. what it was about um, to see them perform their honesty honestly it, it was just wonderful to sit back and watch a team perform and you were the chief NASA test director and and uh, so we had we shared some good times too absolutely yeah those are some of the I have some really sweet memories from from the shuttle program and when I think about shuttle I think about the lessons learned and, and even how we apply them today. Um, I guess I would ask you, you know, what are some of the lessons learned from shuttle, Mike, that you think um, about? Yeah, um, I was thinking about this the other night too, and, and, and I think it comes down to everyone that worked on the shuttle program and an Artemis program now and SLS and any, any program, you need to be a responsible individual. Whether you're an engineer or a technician or a safety professional or an ops specialist, you need to be a responsible engineer, responsible person in, in, in your position. And, and that, to me, means you do the best job you can possibly do. If you happen to sign off on something uh, because your job requires it, when you sign that piece of paper that says, I have reviewed that paper and I agree with everything in this, and it's as best as we can possibly do. And, and if everyone held that, 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 that mindset of being a responsible person for themselves first, then I think that would bleed over into the rest of the team and, and for the good of the program because nothing would get by. Someone would say, no, wait a minute now, this is not the right thing to do. I, I, I know better and I need to speak up. You know, we talked a lot about open conversations and, and that. I, I think that starts with being a responsible individual. There definitely is a, I mean, as a launch director, you know, we depend on everyone to do their job and to do their job well. And then we have to all do it together, too. So there's an individual piece of responsibility. But I often say it's it's almost like an orchestra, right? Everybody has an instrument. And each of those are beautiful in and of themselves, but it's really how they all fit together. And so you're absolutely right, Mike. And that is something that we talk about in our launch team planning for Artemis. It's It's doing, you know, doing your job and doing it well and then looking across our team and then how we all perform as a team. You know, you can be the best single player, right. but you got to be able to work in this team environment. I think that's really important. I remember as a young engineer and, and uh, i just gotten on the launch team and I was a test director, daily ops, daily operations test director. And, and I had a deviation that, that the team wanted me to sign, and, and, I, and I signed it, and then I took it back. One, other, one open slot on the deviation was, was for the SPE, Shuttle Project Engineer, and that was Chris Ferry at the time, rest his soul. Um, and I gave it to Chris, and he, he went through, and he read it once, and he read it twice, and then he signed it. I said, gosh, Chris, you read that thing twice. 
He said, that's what my signature means. It means I've read this, I understand it, I concur with it, and hand it off to the next person. That, that's being responsible. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So when you think about, um, when, you, when you think about the shuttle program, what do you, what's the <laughs> single greatest accomplishment? Oh my goodness. Single. Can you can you name just one? <laughs> okay, what's what's the top five? Right. Well, <laughs> the shuttle, yeah, the top five. The shuttle, you know, it, it, it was the next logical step in, in America's manned spaceflight program, and it, it taught us how to live and work in low Earth orbit for two weeks at a time. Uh, another thing it taught us was international cooperation and, and how to how to uh, work with our international partners like we'd really never done before. I mean, we shook hands and Paul Soyuz test program, but never really worked together in, in orbit. And the shuttle taught us that. Um, it taught us the value of, of open discussion and, and being responsible. If, if, you're, if you're on a team, any, anybody as part of the team needs to be responsible. Um, living in, and working in low Earth orbit two weeks at a time, that was the, that was probably, the, well, it was. It was next logical step in the shuttle, in, 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 in America's space flight program. Uh, after that was the International Space Station, where we're permanently in, on orbit, obviously, since oh, over 20 years now, for God's sakes. So the shuttle taught us that. It, the shuttle was ahead of its time. Um, it was very, very capable machine. Um, with reusable, that capable, right? Reusable. With that capability and reusability came complexity. And that, um, you know, that causes a couple of issues. And, and the reusability issue for, for your program um, we learned how to refly spacecraft. We'd never done that before, ever. Not a booster, not a rocket, not a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. and, and so we learned how to do that, and that was a tremendous learning curve. And, and we learned what to do, and we also learned what not to do in, re, in reflying spacecraft and boosters. And so it, it, uh, it taught us a, a heck of a lot. Yeah, well, I was sorry I, to see it go. I mean, I completely agree. I, I think about the things that you touched on. I think about, you know, the long duration flights that we had yeah. aboard the International Space Station that really prepares us for these longer duration flights beyond our home planet. So um, it, it really was a, a very successful program and something I know for both of us, you know, we spent a great deal of our careers working on. Yeah, you bet. So when you think about um, the launch team, and if you were to think about where I am today, right, getting ready for that first launch, um, what was it like to lead the, the shuttle program or to lead the launch team in those final missions, Mike? I you think know, you I, talked about that it was the same, but there had to be a little something that felt different knowing that it was, it was at the end of the program. It was at the end of the program. We, we dealt with, um, we dealt with that fact um, outside of the control room, not on launch day. You know, there were there were some people that that uh, openly questioned the end of the program coming and, and what to do, and, and so. But we dealt with that outside of the control room. Once once the launch team uh, went into the firing room and shut that door, it was it was game on, and and uh, you know, it's, it's like game day. It's like it's like a major event game day. Um, as a launch director, as you know. I mean, you get to sit back and, and watch the team perform. The launch director doesn't have a heck of a lot to do, but you're responsible for everything. Uh, so you get to sit back and watch the team perform and, and uh, kibitz here, kibitz there, listen to all the discussions, chime in when you want to, leave them go when you, when you think that's the right thing to do. Um, it's a wonderful position created back in the early days of, of manned space flight. As that position, as that one individual who's able to sit back and watch watch everyone perform without a lot to do, on purpose, so you can uh, get a sense of whether we're going the right direction or not. It's um, <laughs> it's unlike any other position in the world. I don't want to say job because it's not a job. It, it was a it was a position that I that I loved. So, Mike, what was your favorite part of being the launch director? Oh my goodness. Um, Honestly, it was just relishing the moment, watching the team perform, um, reflecting on, on everything that occurred during that flow up to that, that final day, those final hours, those final minutes, and a, 
Are we ready to go? Have we done everything we can possibly do to make this flight as safe as possible for, for our friends, right. the astronauts that are riding this thing? And, and um, to sit back and, and, and know you have that responsibility and authority, but it didn't feel like it. It, it, it was just such a natural feeling to have that, that final go, no go. Um, and to look out the windows of the Launch Control Center and, and look at the shuttle on the pad and think about my seven friends on top of that thing, four for 135, um, that's how I made my final decision, thinking about my friends riding that thing. Um, so it, 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 uh, there were so many good parts of launch director. Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> Just driving in in the morning and, and knowing what was about mm -hmm. to happen. Um, it, it's, you know, entering the fire room is like coming through the tunnel into a grand arena on, it, in the it, Super Bowl or something. It, it, it is very similar to that. I agree with you. I, I talk about, um, you know, at the end of the space shuttle program, one of the things that I loved to do was when I would pull into the parking lot of the Launch Control Center, well, the first thing I would do is if I came through and the closeout crew was configuring their van, getting ready to go in, I liked to stop yeah. and, and I liked to, to talk to them. Your guys. Um, they were my guys and, <laughs> and I liked to talk to them because we were going to send them into the pad, right, with a fully loaded tank. And, um, and so I always liked to stop and talk to them for a few minutes, see how they were feeling. And then when I would pull into the parking lot, very similar, little different, but similar, is I would always stop in the parking lot and kind of look out at the pad, and it always amazed me how big the shuttle looked. Like sitting out on the pad, it seemed like it was always against yeah. that dark sky, yeah. and, and you would look out, and, and she was just so beautiful, and you would think about, you know, we're getting ready to send the teams into the pad, we're getting ready to um, get ready to send the crew in, and, uh, but it was taking a moment to, kind of reflect on what it was that was before you that day. You, you really had to do that, and I'm glad you mentioned that, and, and I hope everyone did, and I'm, I'm, I'll bet they did it. To reflect on it before you actually put the headset on, to think about what we were about to do, and and, uh, and do it on behalf of the crew. Um, I remember one morning I was driving in, and it was a, a low overcast, and, and the xenon lights were on. And you could see the, the shadow of the vehicle and the, and the FSS and RSS on the clouds. Oh, wow. And I was driving and I looked at that and I went, holy cow, what are we about to do? Okay. And then I got together and we went, went and, uh, and launched that day. So it, it, uh, there were so many things in, in 11 years that, that I did the job that I, I just can't even begin to put them together. It, uh, just a glorious time. It was just yeah. fun, fun, fun. And you had a great team. Yes, right? indeed. You had a great team. Was there ever a time where you felt like, you know, there was a, a, a tough call or, a, or a, um, you know, the countdown clock is moving and you're late in launch countdown? I mean, did those things cause you stress or cause you stress as a, a launch director? Or is it one of those things where it's muscle memory and you train for it in a <laughs> sim and, and, and so when launch day rolls around, yeah. you're ready to go? Uh, it, it's the latter. I mean, you get you get so used to the clock. Just the clock is just another part of the deal, right? Um, I remember once we launched with three seconds left in the launch window, and, and Sean O'Keefe was the was the administrator. And he came up to me afterwards and he pointed to the clock. He said, "Mike, you only had three seconds left." And I said, "Sean, we had three seconds left." <laughs> and he just went, <laughs> "Okay." Um, so yeah, you're working against the clock. But I, I remember, you know, Bob Seek trained me. He was, he was my mentor. I was his assistant launch director for a period of time. And, and uh, he taught me that lesson. You know, you solve the problems and then you look up at the clock. If there's time left, you're, you're, you're ready to go. If there's not, you come back the next day. Right. So the right. clock, you, ne you, never, you never fight the clock. The clock can be your friend, um, but you, you never fight it. It is, it is what it is. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about day of launch traditions. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite one? Was it was it having beans after after launch or going down to the lobby and you know did you have a launch day tradition? Um, you know we all ate ate lunch um, after tanking and uh, as the crew was entering the vehicle. Typically we'd we'd go have lunch and that was sort of a potluck uh, lunch up on the fourth floor of the launch control center and 
Um, so everyone brought in whatever, whatever their favorite was. You had something from South Carolina, I had something from Pennsylvania, and we all, de we all ate together. So that was fun. And, and uh, traditions after, after launch, sure, we had the Norm Carlson beans and cornbread, which I pretended to eat. Um, I was never a big fan of them, but uh, no, it was a tradition. And traditions are very, very important. Um, I agree. I'm sure each, each, uh, each organization had their own traditions that led, up, that led them to that, that point in time of launch countdown and, and T-Zero. So it, uh, traditions are very important. I, I hope you're developing them in the Artemis program. Yes, we absolutely are. Um, and I agree with you. I think it's really important. And you talked about the beans and cornbread. You know, for me, I, I did love the beans and cornbread. <laughs> but the part of it that I loved the most was more the symbolic nature of it, right? That we're going sure. down after a huge Absolutely. accomplishment and we're kind of, we're, we're breaking, we're breaking bread, bread together. Bread. We're, we're having a meal together, even though it was a, a small meal, but it was like having that time um, in the launch control center with the team after accomplishing something like launch, you know, to me that was really important. And so I agree with you. It's, um, it's important to have those traditions, whatever your team is, right? To establish those things. And, and I know you're right that there were personal traditions in the launch control mm -hmm. center as well as team traditions. Indeed, yeah, and, and yeah, that's very important um, to, to establish those traditions and hold on to them. And, and they grow over time, you'll, you'll develop new ones or let, the, let some of them go maybe, it, it, however it works out. But, but it, it allows people to come together and, and break bread, as you say, shake each other's hands, pat each other on the back. And, and then I always had to come over here for a press conference, and maybe maybe you can change that and, <laughs> and get the press conference delayed. I don't know, but so I had just a limited amount of time in the in the control center before I had to come over here. But but uh, and that was part of the deal. I mean, this is right. part of the process. So I'm glad to do it. So have you been to the launch control center recently? Not recently, no. Oh well, then you need to come. Uh, well, <laughs> not, you got my phone number. All right. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask you if if you'd been recently, if you if you'd seen any changes there. Well, I was in I was in um, Fire Room Four with the SpaceX launch director um, prior to the first man flight. Um, uh, we wanted to talk, and and he invited me into the control room to see the changes they had made to, to Fire Room Four, which is quite significant from the mm -hmm. old shuttle room. Uh, but Mike was Mike is a good guy. He he has has the right mindset to be a a human spaceflight launch director, and, and uh, he, he just wanted to chat about what it was like, sort of like this. And right. So yeah, I've, I've seen Fire Room 4, and, and uh, um, different than what we remember, but that's okay, change change happens. Well, um, over in Fire Room 1, if you recall, right, during Constellation, right, you did a study that looked at the kind of the launch team, design team. Right. And, uh, and we had a different layout in Fire Room 1. It's still there, and okay. we are going to use that for Artemis 1. Okay, so uh, we're going to give that a test drive and see how it goes. Um, we've made a couple of changes, not in the layout, but maybe in the, the makeup of, of how the consoles are arranged okay. uh, in terms of disciplines, right? What we heard from our team was that that being with like disciplines, like the electrical team and the avionics team and the cryoprop team, that, that they wanted to sure. be together. Um, but the layout is the same, so I think you'll find it very familiar when you come <laughs> back and take a look. All I need is an invitation, Charlie. All right, well, you're invited. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's see. Shuttle missions, do you have a favorite? Shuttle. As a launch director, are you allowed to say if you do? <laughs> um, well, it has to be the last one um, because those four folks were so special and, and, and the way we prepared for it and, and everyone pulled together and, and, and we really truly did do it the same way on the last mission that we did for dozens and dozens prior to that and, and uh, it was very important to do it that way and the team performed and even, in, even with the knowledge that a lot of them were going to get let go and it, it's just a very difficult situation. But the team pulled together and, and did it right, and I was just so proud of them. And uh, I, that's got to be, from a from a team perspective, my favorite. Yes, that makes sense. How about from landing day? Do you have any any memories from STS one thirty five landing day? Well, landing days. Um, I always describe landing day as the best part of my job. It was. Um, 
that was the uh, the time where you got to greet the crew coming off the vehicle. You know, you could put your hand up there and still feel the heat from the tiles from mm -hmm. from uh, entering the atmosphere. Uh, the crew would come down the, the walkway and they'd be a little wobbly or something, you know, and they would walk around and, and uh, didn't have a lot to do. It was more more ceremonial. So the landing day was very, very special. And, um, the final one was that was bittersweet. There is no question. Um, but it worked fine. And they were safe. Yeah, I remember 135 landing, you know, I was the chief of launch and landing at the time. And so I was always out at the, I got um, the great honor of being in the firing room for launch and then to be at the runway for, right. for landing. And I remember, um, you know, usually it's kind of like the launch day, something similar, right? We would normally get the, you know, you get downgrade on the vehicle and, and you would have, you know, different groups that were coming in to do assessments. And, and as the folks began to leave as the chief of the office, I would tend to, you know, start making my way back to the office. It had been a long day already. But I remember on 135 day, I, I kind of like that launch day where you, you couldn't quite bring yourself to leave. I remember staying and we got, you know, got the orbiter ready to tow back and, and I was still hanging around and uh, and I remember walking, walking back with her to the OPF and kind of, you know, and it was a it was a hot day. Mm -hmm. And every now and then as we walked with Atlantis, I'd kind of duck under the wing for a little bit of shade, you know, as we were towing, towing her back. And <laughs> and I remember thinking you know, how special that was, how that was a memory that I would take with me through my entire career with just what it felt like to to want to be a part of that team and to know that that really was, you know, that final touchdown. Um, the program was coming to an end. It had been a great program. It had been a great run. And, and to be able to kind of walk Atlantis back was a just a really special, special thing yeah, for me. Yeah, celebrated with the team. Yep what it was all about. Absolutely. Yeah. I have one memory. Can I tell you one more memory? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was landing of 133 or maybe 134. But I had a, a, a commander ask me, he said, Mike, can, can you get me out to the end of the runway? And I can watch landing, standing next to the runway, next to the approach. I said, yeah, we can, we can probably work something out like that. And, and, and so we did. We walked out, special permission, all that kind of stuff. We got out right, right next to the, the approach of the runway, and, and uh, we were on the proper end, and the shuttle came in. And, and this is a four-time commander space shuttle. And he stood there, and he watched it come in, and, he, and you could just tell he was reflecting on, on everything he had been through. Um, and he just, it was, it was, it was, he was in awe of the machine, along with reflecting on what he had been through, and it was it was a that was a very special moment. Uh, I want to say you know there was a tear there. I don't know if there was. The commander would never allow that probably, but but uh, he he wanted to see the shuttle land up close from the ground rather than the cockpit on one of the final missions, and we were able to do that for him. Yeah. That's that's the type of teamwork and and sharing that made the special, made the, the shuttle launch team and landing team and processing team so special. We all shared in it. It was, it was all of ours. It was all of ours. Absolutely. I mean, you felt that connection. Um, and I will tell you, for me, that day that I walked back, and there was a number of people who walked with us as we headed back to the OPF, it was a day that was in awe of the machine and the team. Mm -hmm. and um, yes. And there were definitely tears and laughter along the way. Um, it, it was a very special time. It, it was an incredible time in my career. I spent really from the time I came to Kennedy Space Center as a young woman right out of school until the space shuttle ended in, in one role or another supporting space shuttle. And then now to sit here as the Artemis launch director right. and think about returning to the Returning to the moon, returning humanity to the moon. Um, it, <laughs> good stuff, huh? <laughs> it is good stuff. <laughs> and so many of the lessons we talked about, about you know believing in the team and and it and just you know what you can accomplish when you have a group 
or a team that is dedicated to the mission, um, that does their work with passion, with intention. It's really amazing what you can accomplish. And I see that same thing in our Artemis team. Very good. Um, yeah, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a gift to a launch director. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've done some poking around and uh, uh, people are very, very uh, proud to have you as their launch director and, and have all the confidence in the world. And, and uh, you're America's manned space flight launch director. That's pretty good stuff. That is pretty good stuff. And it is a job I feel so blessed to have. And I am so lucky that I've had, you know, wonderful mentors and coaches and, you know, individuals that have helped me. I mean, you and Bob Seek and so many others, but especially when it comes to the launch director role. I mean, you've been so helpful to me and I'm, I'm so indebted to you <laughs> and to Bob for always sharing so openly with me. Sure. As launch directors, we certainly get the privilege to say the magic words, we are go for launch. But what truly makes our job so special is the team we get to lead. Our launch control team since the shuttle program and now with the Artemis program was and is truly composed of amazing and incredibly hardworking individuals. It is my honor, and I know it was Mike's as well, to be your launch director. It was amazing to be part of launch control team during the shuttle program. And I am so looking forward to leading this team for Artemis. Back to you, Janet. It was bittersweet to say goodbye to NASA's shuttle program. I was honored to be a part of several missions and to get to know many of our employees, some who spent their entire careers working the orbiter's 135 missions. This special look back is a tribute to all of them. When we close this chapter in our nation's space history, we started new ones. The Kennedy Space Center has transformed from a place that served only government launches to a vibrant multi-user spaceport opening space up to commercial companies with new technologies. We're launching new dreams. We're going back to the moon and this time to stay. And soon we're gonna be seeing some space tourists. Thank you for joining us and sharing these memories today. But remember, you can spend more time with Atlantis at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. She may be grounded, but she can still give you some goosebumps. Thank you.